welcome to Districts 2016. We are so excited to have you here with us tonight. Who made it here safely? Okay. Who made it here kind of safely? No, you gotta give some love to your drivers. It's not easy driving across the state with you hook ones in the back, you know what I'm saying? Hey. Alright, hey, we're excited to have you here. We just want to start off quick with a little bit of uh, announcements for you. First off, I thought I would never do it that way. Well, they've done more research and that, that list has been dwindled down a little bit. It was at 100, now it's down to zero. <laughs> they have found a function for every single one of these things. It was their belief in evolution that got them to even just write it off and cut off the appendix, get rid of your tonsils, oh, you don't know no use. Well, sometimes we need to remove things if they go bad, but I could remove my arms right now and still live. That doesn't mean they didn't have a function. You know, appendix is part of the immune system and things like that. So it was the idea or belief in evolution that got them to write it off and do bad science. But yeah, just get rid of all these things. They don't serve a purpose anyway. And we have the concept of junk DNA. When they were studying DNA, at one point, they said, you know what, only like 2% of your DNA does anything. It, it, the rest is useless. 2% codes and makes these proteins that carry out the functions in your body, the rest is just junk. That's evidence of evolution, just leftover junk over history, maybe someday it'll go away. God certainly didn't create the DNA, why would he create something that's 98% junk? Well, we've done further studying on it, and now they realize that 98% that they said was junk, they found it's more complex than the 2% that makes proteins. It's instructions that tell the 2% what to do, and it's phenomenally complex. I have a whole other talk that I give on DNA, it, just, it, it would just blow you away. But it was a belief in evolution that got them to write it off and call it junk. They said this is probably the biggest mistake in the history of biology, They're assuming that this stuff was junk, because now it's just blowing them away. But again, the idea of evolution has actually gotten in the way. Um, People say, yeah, but the Bible's not a science textbook. I totally agree. I'm glad it's not, because even fewer people would read it. And science textbooks have to be rewritten and corrected over and over and over. So much, that's just kind of how science works. It's not really a bad thing. It's just kind of natural. You think you know something, find out later, yeah, we were wrong about that, so you correct it. That's how that works. The Bible is not that way. It's not that we're continually rewriting the Bible and correcting it to get it to, uh, up to speed. No, it was written once, thousands of years ago, and it's, it stood the test of time. It's amazing. The Bible is not a science textbook, but it provides a framework for us to properly understand and interpret science. Because science is all about interpretation. Facts don't speak for themselves. Every fact has to be interpreted. So the Bible gives us an excellent framework to do proper interpretations. For example, the Bible does talk about astronomy. It's not a science textbook to give us every minute detail, but it does give us a framework to understand. It says this in Psalm 33, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made their starry host by the breath of his mouth. God is one who created this universe miraculously. It didn't happen through an accidental big bang. Stars don't form themselves by gases swirling around, but that's what you all hear. Oh, we see out here in this galaxy, there's a birth of a star. See those swirling gases? That's the birth of a star. Isn't that exciting? You know what they actually see? They see gases swirling. They don't see stars forming, they see gases swirling. It's their story that they're going to swirl and form a star. Physics go totally against that, but it fits in with the biblical account that God is the one who created to begin with. The Bible talks about geology. It says this in the book of Genesis, chapter 6. I'm going to bring floodwaters to the earth to destroy all life under the heavens. Every creature that has a breath of life in it, everything on earth, will perish. So, when you're out looking at the earth, particularly the Grand Canyon, and you see all those layers there, you're like, that's really interesting. Look at all those layers. How did that happen? The Bible gives us a framework to understand that. He says there was a worldwide flood. What would a worldwide flood do? A worldwide flood would lay sedimentary layers down all over the planet, and they would be filled with fossils burying whatever was living at the time. That's what we see in all the layers of the earth, billions of fossils that were buried catastrophically by water. The Bible helps us understand what we're seeing in the physical world around us. Non-living chemicals came together to form a living cell. It's a beautiful story, just no science behind it. But the Bible explains that they God miraculously created life, but we don't see it happening accidentally. They do. They have faith that everything came from nothing, and there was a big bang that formed an orderly universe. They have faith that non-living chemicals formed a living cell. They have faith that that single cell somehow copied itself and kept getting better and better and better and turned into human beings that can explain the whole history of the universe. They, they have no evidence for that. That's their faith, but they, they like to call it science, but really 
they have faith that all those things happen. Then we have this in Genesis, it said, And God said, Let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds. The Bible says that God created creatures that could reproduce after their kind. Meaning, yes, they can have a nice variety, but it's always within limits. You breed dogs together, and you will always get some kind of dog. You can breed and get a nice variety. In fact, dogs, dingoes, coyotes, and wolves can all breed together because they're the same general kind of animal. And you get a nice variety, like a wolf dog. But you can never breed a wolf and a dog and get a cucumber. Because they don't have genetic information to make cucumbers, but they can make things that look like dogs or wolves. So that's what the Bible said in Genesis, written you know, a long time ago. And that's what we see in modern biology. Yeah, we can produce a nice variety, but the genetics always give us limits. You can't go beyond those major groups. So that's what the Bible said. I go into a lot more detail on that in the, my DVD on DNA. Um, but we're going to look at Scripture a little bit closer now to see is there anything else in Scripture that we can evaluate scientifically. Well, we can look at the number of stars. The Bible talks about the number of stars. Jeremiah says, As the host of heavens cannot be numbered, neither the sand of the sea be measured, so will I multiply the seed of David my servant. Jeremiah was saying, You can't count the stars. That made no sense when he said that. That would be like me saying, You can't count the people in this room. There's so many, you can't even count them. Now, there are a lot of people here, but you can count them. When Jeremiah said that, including today, you can look up in the sky. And you could see roughly 3,000 stars. Well, that's a lot of stars. You, it's not so many you could count them. That's from one point of the earth. If you went to the opposite side of the earth, you'd see another 3,000. So you could physically see about 6,000 stars if you walked around the earth. That's how many you could visibly see with your eye. You know, that's when they didn't have telescopes and all that. Why would Jeremiah say the stars are uncountable? They would look at it and say, what are you, crazy? It would take a little time, but I can count them. Give you a pretty close approximation. But he said they're uncountable. Well, today we got some more information. Scientists don't know how many stars there are. They say there, I don't know, there's 10 trillion trillion. Just this ballpark figure throwing a huge number out there, estimating. They are uncountable. That's what Jeremiah said a long time ago when it didn't even make sense to him. But God has inspired him to say, trust me, Jeremiah, these things are uncountable. You may have heard of the Hubble telescope. This is the Hubble deep field. What was happening is they were looking at the sky, and there was a particular spot that looks kind of dark like is there even anything out there? It was a really small speck of the sky. They said, let's focus in our telescope on this little dark spot and leave the aperture open for a long time to see if anything develops, if there's really anything out there. It was such a small speck, it represented one two hundred or one twenty-four millionth of the entire sky. That small of a speck, one twenty-four millionth of a spot, they focused the telescope on. And then they developed their picture, and this is what they saw. 3,000 stars in that tiny, 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 tiny speck. But you know what? Those aren't stars. Those are galaxies. 3,000 galaxies, and each galaxy probably has 100 billion stars in it. From this tiny spot in space that's 124 millionth of the entire sky. That's why scientists are like, we have no idea how many stars are out there, but it's just trillions and trillions. It's uncountable. Jeremiah could have told them that a long time ago. So did Jeremiah just get lucky and say something didn't make any sense that turned out to be true later? Or might God have said, hey Jeremiah, write this down, trust me. Then Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, he said, one star different from another in glory. Paul said, all the stars are different, they're unique. That didn't make any sense. You look up in the sky tonight, some stars seem a little brighter, some seem a little dimmer, and once in a while there seems a little color to them, some here and there. But other than that, they look the same. So why would you say they're all unique? Each one is different from the other. A modern astronomer tell us they're all like snowflakes. There's not one star that's just like another. They all have their unique signature with their temperature and light and all these things and elements in them. That's what Paul said, writing almost 2,000 years ago. So did he get lucky or was God inspiring him? Then we have the shape and suspension of the earth. We know that for many years people thought the earth was flat and it was suspended maybe on the back of Atlas. And it's like a pancake here. Many people thought that it was flat and resting on the back of giant elephants. Because everything we know is resting on something, right? So the earth is huge, it's got to be on something, it can't just be there or nothing. So it's on the back of giant elephants. Well, if everything's got to be on something, what are the elephants on? Well, the elephants aren't a giant space turtle. People were dead serious about this. Okay, well, what's the turtle on? Well, the turtle 
turtle's on the back of another turtle. Okay, what's that turtle on? Well, that turtle's on the back of another turtle. Okay, what's that turtle on? It's turtles all the way down. It's just turtles, turtles, turtles forever. That, that's silly, but that's what a lot of people thought. Well, what does the Bible say? Isaiah says that it's he that sits on the circle of the earth, the Hebrew where there is kub, means sphere. The Bible has always taught that the earth is a sphere around. The Bible never taught that the earth is flat. So people should say, yeah, we used to believe the earth is flat because of the Bible. No, the Bible never taught that. The Bible says it's a sphere. Also in Job it says that he stretched out the north over the empty place. He hanged the earth upon nothing. Job, writing over 2,000 years ago, said the earth is hanging on nothing. Which didn't make any sense, but now in modern astronomy we understand gravity and all that. It's just floating around, orbiting the sun, hanging on nothing. Oh, that's what the Bible told us a long time ago. Then we have this Leviticus. Moses wrote, the life of the flesh is in the blood. Each human red blood cell contains about 270 million molecules of hemoglobin and carries oxygen through your blood, through your body. Very important. You didn't have this system or had a slightly different amount going through your body, you couldn't survive. Blood is very, very crucial for your life. Well, doctors used to actually drain people with blood out of their body when they got sick. In fact, that's fine. Because Jesus did not die on the cross to be your savior. Jesus will only play Lord and nothing else. And he will never, ever be a part of your life. He will take all of it or none of it. And Peter, on that mountaintop, sees Moses, Elijah, lightning boy, gets caught up in it. And he makes Jesus a part of it. And God shows up and says, that's my son. I love him. That is my plan for you. He will not be a part of any show. Show's over. This one, you follow. Cloud's gone. And Jesus will always stand in there. If someone told you, oh no, Jesus sits down on the cross when he answers your prayers, or he'll be your counselor, or he'll be your guide, or he'll be your forever friend, or your homeboy. Jesus gave his life to buy you and all of you, and he will not be a part of it. He will take all of it or nothing. All of it or nothing. So see, this isn't a story about getting caught up in pornography or getting caught up in smoking weed or getting caught up in alcohol. This isn't a story about getting caught up with your boyfriend or your girlfriend or immorality. This isn't a story about disobeying your parents or your language or who you are in the locker room versus who you are in the youth room. This is a story about guys who are following Jesus who just made Jesus a part of everything that's going on. And God says, show's over. He will be all of what's going on. Or he'll be none of what's going on. So let me ask you, is he a part of your life? Or is he the very purpose of your life? See, the word gives it away. Christian. You ever thought of that? You're Christ in. You're one who is now completely devoted, committed to following the life and teachings of Christ, a Christ in. And that inhabits everything you are. It's how you do your relationships. It's how you do the internet. It's how you treat your parents. It's how you treat your little brother, who, by the way, is going through your stuff back home right now. <laughs> is he the very center the very compass that guides your decision making and how you see life and what you want to do with your life and what you want to do with your possessions and how you see your future or is he great to have as a savior in case the hell option is true I promise you Jesus did not die on the cross to be savior to be counselor, to be guide. He died to give his life, to buy you, so that he is your Lord. And once he is your Lord, he'll be Savior, God, answer prayer. He'll be your compass. But God will only be God. Nothing else. 
And some of you are sitting here right now, and maybe you were brought here by friends, and you're like, so this is a Christian weekend? <laughs> and how many times do we have to sit through this? And some of you are listening going, Chris, that just seems unfair. Who is this God that demands he wants all of me? All of you. I very stopped and thought about it. That every time you turn on your phone, every time you turn on your iPad, every time you flip on the computer, every newspaper you buy, the home page, the front page, screams Jesus. Has that ever dawned on you? Has it ever dawned on you that the moment I flip on my phone, the moment I go on my iPad, I look at it, and it always comes up with the date, and it's 2016. Has you ever stopped? Have you ever stopped and asked yourself, 2016 to what? He changed time. He changed our electronics. He changed calendar. It's been 2000 and 16 years since these stories and everything has been split in two. Everything before him is in BC, before Christ. Everything after him in AD, Anno Domini in Latin, in the year now of our Lord. I know we're trying to change those now, but everything for 2,000 years split in half because of him. Who does that? You were just out of school for a couple weeks. Why? Dude was born in a cave 2,000 years ago. That's jacked up. What kind of baby do you have to be to be born in a cave to get you out of school 2,000 years later? <laughs> And you may go, I don't believe in Jesus. Well, he's God. Right. You still can't go to school on Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have another holiday coming up in a couple months where my kids are going to die eggs. They're going to go out in the backyard and find plastic ones. They're going to have chocolate bunnies. The, the girls eat starting at the ears. Of course, my little boy thinks it's funny to bite the butt first. <laughs> He's done it for five years, and his sisters still laugh. I don't care how you celebrate it, we cannot get off our calendar the fact that there was an empty tomb. Has it ever dawned on you who this guy was? He is a swear word. That's awesome. <laughs> Who else is a swear word? You ever thought about that? You ever been around someone walking through a dark place at night and they stub their toe and they're like, oh, Jesus Christ. Oh. That's amazing. <laughs> we don't do that to good teachers. We don't do that to great leaders. I've never heard anyone walking through and stub their toe and they're like, oh, Benjamin Franklin. <laughs> <laughs> it's never happened. You ever hear your thumb talk of Zeus? We will Jesus, we will Jesus Christ, we will goddamn things. Two thousand years since these stories. He's a swear word. There is power in that name. And he will not be a part of your life. But in spite of who you are, and what you've done, and where you come from, he will take all of you. Are you kidding me? He will gladly take all of you. But he is too big of a God, and too big of a sacrifice to be part of anything you're doing. He will take all. Or he will row away. Unfortunately, I think we've grown up in a day and age where we've taught kids, you say a prayer, and because Jesus died on the cross, he's happy just to come skipping in your life and be a part of 
your great big narrative. And God says, show it over. This was my son. This is my love for you. And this is what you follow. And I realize I am talking to an auditorium full of the wealthiest kids in the world today. And because we have electricity, and running water, and education, television, computers, schools we can go to, you're in the top 11% of the wealthiest kids in the world today. Your family owned more than two cars. You have more than two TVs. You have more than two computers. You have more than four phones in the family. <laughs> You are in the top 5% of the wealthiest kids in the world today. Probably most of us. You see, we have great things around us. And we just put our Christianity as part of it. Let me warn you. If this is the way God dealt with people, then this may just be the way God deals with us. He won't be a part of your show. He didn't die on the cross just to say at the end you have a savior. He said, no, I died to buy you to be Lord. And once I'm Lord, salvation comes with it. We're going to unpack this story tomorrow morning. We're going to pick up with him walking down the mountain. For tonight, what have you done to God this split time? Changed our calendar. Set up everything BCAD. It's been 2016. See, Savior or swear word. This God, this weekend, brought you away from the rest of the group to show you something different. My only request is when you walk in here, be open. Be open to what He wants to talk to you about. God, may we be people that get over ourselves. We're not growing up in a third world country. We're not growing up wondering if we will eat today. In those places, it's easy to surrender everything to you because they have nothing. God, we are growing up with great wealth. Our rooms, our homes, even the simplest ones in here are filled with great things. And God, it's easy on this mountaintop to have you just part of our life. May we understand you want to be all of our life. You want to inhabit every decision, every relationship. You want our goals, our hopes, our dreams and desires. And in return, we need to be yours, your children. Love.